Brian Morarescu is the author of The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name. And while the basis of that religion is the concept of dying before dying, something he connects with from the Eleusian mysteries up through the founding of Christianity, in particular, the Eucharist, he feels that perhaps it wasn't wine and a wafer that was the original Eucharist, that it was perhaps a spiked sort of wine, spiked with psychedelics, perhaps something from a lizard or a blue water lily, perhaps ergot, which, as we know much later, was the psychoactive ingredient of LSD. Now, I wanted to talk to Brian for a number of reasons. As someone who is fascinated with psychedelics and religion, and that's really been my my own path for well over a quarter century of my life, when the book was published, I just had to find out what all this was about. And it's a fantastic book, as you'll hear during our interview. And interestingly, he's never done a psychedelic before. And he spent 12 years writing this book, including going to the Vatican secret archive, talking with Vatican priests, traveling through Greece and Paris and studying artwork. It's, it's just fascinating. And uh, in the beginning, you'll hear us laugh a little bit as we talk because I had found his book from a Daily Beast article, but very shortly after, uh, he was on the Joe Rogan podcast, and that was his first bit of press, the first time he talked about the book. So you can imagine going from being a, your first book ever to being in front of an audience of 10 million people. Graham Hancock, who is a regular Rogan uh, guest, wrote the foreword to the book. I can't recommend the book enough, and I really hope you enjoy this interview. We talk a lot about conspiracy theories and something that uh, listeners often point out is that, first of all, some conspiracy theories are often rooted in truth. And then how do you differentiate between what's purely a conspiracy theory, something like QAnon, which we discuss often here, and something that actually just might take a little bit more scholarship and understanding and connecting the dots as in, say, the psychedelic origins of Christianity. Listen, judge for yourself, but uh, I also really recommend reading the book because even though we got to chat for an hour and he's a lovely person to talk to and you'll learn a lot of insights during this talk, the book is one of the deepest dives into this topic that I can imagine. Enjoy. I, I, it was a trial by fire in Austin, Texas, man. So I'm, I'm used to this now. <laughs> oh, is that your first one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's a story in itself. I mean, you, you spend 12 years writing this book and your first press is <laughs> the Rogan podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that was the publisher's idea, not mine, by the way. Well, that's, that's great that they landed that. I mean, that's such a great, and I mean, it's very topical for him, obviously, as well. But how was the experience? Um, it, almost exactly as I expected. He, he can dip into, you know, an uber nerddom on this. I mean, I think he and I share like the identical library, at least, at least one section of our library yeah. is identical. So I, I, thought, I thought he was fantastic, man. That's awesome. That's good to hear. And you did... I mean, it was, it was fantastic. I, I went to uh, Las Vegas to, I live, I live in Los Angeles. So I went to Vegas to visit my father. So that's a four hour cool. ride. So I got to listen to it. And my wife, sometimes with my podcast choices is always, you know, like, ah, <laughs> and I said, look, I, I need to listen. I'm, I want to interview Brian. I need to listen. She's like, okay, I get it. And <laughs> when you came on, she's uh, because of coronavirus, she's going back to school now because she lost her career in, oh, wow. in, in events. Uh, so she's decided right. to get her master's in linguistics. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so I, because she speaks numerous languages and she's always loved them. And so as soon as you said your pedigree and where you come from, she's like, I want to listen to all of this. <laughs> all right. So that was great. Um, yeah. And especially, uh, you know, actually let's, I have so many different places I want to start, but since we're on that topic, coming from from that and what do you think 
the importance of linguistics are, and especially in a, in a culture now in America where most of our communications are on tweet and grammar is no longer so much of a consideration. Why mm. is the study of language important? Uh, I think the study of classics in particular is, is vital in, in every sense of the Latin word. I think, it's, I think it's a matter of life and death. And you know, in, in the book, I talk about the death of the classics. I quote uh, these two Stanford educated professors, Hansen and Heath, who released this somewhat incendiary book, Who Killed Homer? about the death of classical education. Uh, I mean, even for me, when I, I picked it up by accident in the 90s, it was, it, to me, it still seemed like a throwback a generation ago. It seemed like something that came out of the 1950s and tweed jackets and dead poet society and you know, a part of the academy I didn't really belong to or belong in. Um, but as I started studying, I started realizing that it's the only way to really pierce through some of these big questions. You know, so I dropped this loaded phrase about the best kept secret in history, uh, quoting the, the great Houston Smith uh, and, and his opinion about the mysteries of Eleusis. Uh, but it's also the secret of Christianity, too. I mean, uh, I think we lose sight of the fact that the, the sacred language of Christianity is Greek. I mean, would you study the Torah with somebody who didn't know Hebrew? Would you study the Quran with yeah. somebody who didn't know Arabic? And here we are with all these Christian denominations all over the world. And uh, even me growing up Catholic, I very rarely heard the Greek. I very rarely spoke to a, a priest about the Greek. It wasn't until studying with the Jesuits. Yeah. Uh, and so there's always this tension in classics between the sacred and the, and the profane. I mean, you spend all this time reading this, uh, this Greek literature uh, that came out of Athens. Uh, but uh, you know, another big part of it is the New Testament. And when I started to look at the New Testament with those classical eyes, the, the Greek eyes, uh, everything changed, especially in, in the Gospel of John uh, and some of the texts that, that, that came after. It's just, um, I think that's where the crux of the, of the matter is. Mm. Well, I am not a fan of Las Vegas in general, but they do have a fantastic bookstore. And f I picked this up. Uh, at, when oh, wow. I got there, I don't know if you know it, but I, be, be, after listening to you about the importance of the Greeks, and it is interesting because I mentioned on Twitter to you, I, my academic study is in religion, and it, I found it fascinating the way you posit it. And I've thought about it before, but never so succinctly, the idea that it, the Christian religion kind of pretends that it just was formed whole cloth out of nothing or just emerged. And so you have this very distinct cutting off between mythology and religion. And if we know anything about biology or history, we don't go that way. Everything comes from something else. When did you really, when did it hit you that connection about all of the, about the underpinnings of Christianity being so heavily influenced by these traditions? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, at some point along the way, I mean, I, I think it was even, it was even early. I mean, as, as a teenager, you know, I, again, I'm there reading Homer. That's kind of one of the first things you're, you're reading when you're, when you're reading Greek. And then I'm at this Jesuit prep school, and I'm also reading uh, the New Testament for the first time in Greek. And it's kind of like, it, it's, almost, it's almost so obvious that people forget about it. But I, I have Homer in one hand and the Gospel of John in the other. And I realized, well, th this is the same language. I mean, what, th there must be something to this. Um, and it's, it's pretty clear that the Gospel writers were aware of what was happening in this Hellenistic world. I mean, so the political prominence of the Greeks had fallen, obviously, by the first, second centuries AD. But, the, but Hellenism itself, I mean, the Greek influence itself was still there. So when you're reading Paul's letters, for example, the 21 of the 27 books of the New Testament, he's writing to Greek speakers uh, in Greek places. You know, so the, these, uh, the roots of Christianity obviously are in Galilee and Jerusalem, but, but the seeds start to sprout in communities like Corinth and Ephesus and Rome. And, and all over Italy. I mean, this, this is how Christianity becomes Christianity, and it's doing that in a Greek world. So even if you just approach the Gospels from, from that, that sense, the obvious question is, why were they writing in this language to people who knew about things like the mysteries and who 
for generations, right, had been hearing stories from their parents and grandparents about all these gods and goddesses. Uh, it's really hard to make a left turn into Christianity and divorce everything that came before, and which is not what happened, obviously. Uh, yeah. I think that to, to read the Gospels just in a very plain sense with that in mind begins to open up a world of possibilities. Mm. Now, you could have just as easily, in my opinion, called the book the Catholic Church started the war on drugs. <laughs> but it, it's interesting because I also posted on social yesterday that I was going to be talking to you with the, with the book cover and some people chimed in. And one comment that I've received from a few people is that, oh, I thought it was just a book on wine. Mm. And with the title that you chose, which is a great title though, there is no hint that it's about psychedelics or psychoactive substances. Uh, was that a conscious choice to leave that out of the title? Um, I think it was, uh, depending whether you ask me or the publisher, I think so. And also to leave Jesus out of the title, by the way, which I went back and forth. Uh, one of my alternative titles, which made it into one of my favorite chapters is the drug of immortality. Mm -hmm. I still think that works by the way, uh, the pharmacon Athanasias, that that's the phrase that Ignatius of Antioch used to describe the Eucharist in the early second century AD, which is awfully interesting. The word pharmacon. Um, but I, th I think that uh, I like the ambiguity uh, because at the end, it's actually a very important point. Uh, at the end of the day, the key I'm referring to is not psychedelics. And I, I, I've seen some misinterpretations out there. Uh, what, what, what I mean by the immortality key is what I have in the very beginning of the book, which is the concept of dying before dying mm -hmm. and this near-death mystical experience. Now, certainly psychedelics seem to be an awfully... Uh, fast acting, reliable way to enter into that state, right? Uh, that, that state between life and death. Uh, but it's not the only one. And I want to be very, very clear about that. It's, it's, it's one tool in the spiritual toolkit. Uh, but what I mean by the key is, again, in Greek, and this is something that's preserved at the St. Paul's Monastery, for example, which is an pethanis, prin pethanis, den tapatanis, otan pethanis. If you die before you die, you won't die when you die. That's the actual key. That, that, is, that is the key. It's not psychedelics, it's not drugs. It's this concept of, of um, navigating the liminal space between what you and I are doing right now and, and dreaming and death. And in that state, the, the mystics tell us, the sages tell us, um, is the potential to grasp uh, a very different view of reality. Mm. Now you took 12 years to write the book. Most of the action of the book, though, happens in the last couple of years. So did you have a clear picture of what you were getting into in the beginning, or did it just evolve? And were those first eight or so years mostly spent doing research? It was research. It was raising two daughters. It was <laughs> moving from New York to DC. Uh, yeah, I mean, I say the, the first eight, yeah, that's about right. The first eight to 10 years was, was nights and weekends just playing with this mystery. I mean, I had a, I had a, a real job uh, as a practicing attorney. And um, when I came across that, that study from Hopkins about the, this early psilocybin experiments and these volunteers describing it in mystical terms, two thirds saying it was among the most meaningful of their life, that that's when the circumstantial evidence kind of you know, pulled me into this mystery. And then, you know, I'd never read anything about psychedelics ever and haven't tried them to this day. So it was eight years of like educating myself and doing this multidisciplinary thing where I would reach out to a biblical scholar one day and I'd reach out to an archaeologist the other day. And then I'd reach out to a linguist one day and then I'd reach out to a botanist the other day and then I'd reach out to a, a neuropsychopharmacologist. I mean, there, there was never like one silo to go to and explore this stuff. So, I mean, even though it was like my pastime, the, the real difficulty was trying to combine all these disciplines. And the only way to do that is one at a time. And that was, I mean, just painstaking work for like a lot of years until um, we sold the proposal. And that's when I, I uh, cast off on the adventure. Okay. All right. Well, but they do seem to merge around cannabis in some, in some sense, because you represented uh, Mike James, I believe, right. uh, uh, for, you know, an athlete uh, for using cannabis. Uh, the fact that 
And I've thought about this uh, a lot about athletes and recovery, the fact that they have readily available opioids, which we know the problems with, and yet they can get kicked out of the league for cannabis use. Was your, was your work so far up into that point uh, influential in your decision to um, start working in that space? Yeah, I have a good answer for that, for someone who doesn't do drugs, by the way. I mean, so my, my, my very quick answer uh, for why I got involved in cannabis advocacy was because I saw it as instrumental in psychedelic advocacy uh, and just kind of reassessing our relationship with drugs and realizing that the war on drugs is a very new phenomenon. If you look back over the history of Western civilization, I mean, there's always lore and there's always... Um, you know, a certain caution around these pharmaca, uh, both in the Greek and Roman worlds, but they weren't really illegal the same way that they are today. There was always suspicion about how they were used and for what purposes. Nobody wants to poison anybody or throw a hex on somebody, but they weren't, they didn't have the same relationship that we have today. And it's, it's all just because of when you and I happened to be born by just by shit luck that we're, we're in this, this war on drugs. And at some point, um, I, I realized that it's not just the substance itself, but it's who's using the substance. Um, Ethan Nadelman at the Drug Policy Alliance, I think I saw a TED talk of his that really, that really struck me. But the, the main reason I got involved in advocacy for cannabis is social justice. I mean, the, the idea that uh, a person of color is four times more likely to be arrested for simple cannabis possession and then enter the criminal, the criminal justice system is ridiculous. Yeah. And in, in, in athletics, the idea that a guy like Mike James, NFL players are four times more likely than the general population to develop an opioid addiction is something that, that shouldn't be. We need to think of alternative ways to treat some of these conditions. And we absolutely need drugs out of the criminal justice system. And just last week uh, was described by NBC as a tipping point. I mean, a real watershed, not just what happened with cannabis, but in Oregon, uh, decriminalizing all drugs and about to set up a regulated system uh, for therapeutic psilocybin. It'll be the first jurisdiction on the planet with a really robust regulated system for psilocybin. And it's just, you know, it's, it's a sign of, of things to come. Uh, th this is going to change a lot over the next five, 10 years. Yeah. And that we're, we're entering now a space that I've been doing work in for a long time. I published a, a month ago, a book on psychedelics and ritual and therapy and talking about how ritual and therapy aren't that dissimilar and uh, specifically around um, rethinking psychiatry around benzodiazepines and SSRIs and, and the ways that we treat people in mental health. But I, I was introduced to psychedelics in college at the same time I was introduced to religion. So mm -hmm. I grew up very loosely Catholic, unlike you. When I, in sixth grade, when I said I didn't want to go to CCD anymore, parents were like, yeah, that's fine. So <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was no problem with that from that. So I had no religious um, upbringing in that sense. And so being introduced to psilocybin and LSD and the Buddhist and Hindu texts at the same time, it just made sense. And so I come at it from a very different perspective, one that is anecdotal and communal, admittedly, and your research is fantastic. Let me just add in the way you wrote the book too. I mean, it's a well-written book. It's, it's got the mystery and suspense, but the research and so everything about that. How much resistance have, did you face with the general treaties that um, psychedelics were involved in the Eucharist? Hmm. Um, I haven't, I'm sure it's coming. I haven't gotten too much backlash just yet. And I think every conversation I have, I'm a little bit more careful of what I was trying to say. Um, I, I think it's, it's definitely clear from the book that I'm not talking about the Last Supper. And when I'm investigating the original Eucharist, um, there's, no, there's no data to go on from, from King David's upper chamber there. There's just, there's just, I mean, we're looking for the Holy Grail, right? It hasn't been found for a reason. Uh, so what I'm looking for are proxies for what may have happened uh, on that evening, which is nothing less than a turning point in Western civilization. Bart Ehrman calls it one of the greatest turning points for what happened thereafter, how this illegal cult manages to transform, convert the Roman Empire in only 300 years. Like, why is that? I mean, Rodney Stark writes about this. Elaine Pagels writes about this. All my heroes write about this. And I think we're all looking at pieces 
of the puzzle. Psychedelics are just one, perhaps, very tiny piece of what was happening in those 300 years and that great cultural transformation. Again, amongst Greek people, mainly Greek people, who probably spoke some Greek, probably some Latin, but why would they have converted so quickly? Why was the faith kept alive? Um, I'm really interested in how the earliest Greek speakers would have interpreted the Gospel of John, for example, and how an alternative Eucharist may have made its way into some of these early Greek-speaking communities, and not just made its way, but really just uh, had been retained from what came before. I mean, a place like Corinth, for example, my goodness, like today, an hour west of Eleusis, essentially the spiritual capital of the ancient Greek world, the most famous mystery site. There's Corinth, an hour to its, to its left today. Um, what are the odds that some of those Corinthians themselves weren't initiated at Eleusis or didn't have parents and grandparents who were initiated at Eleusis or went to Delphi, just north of them, to consult the oracle or went, you know, west to the mountains to, to worship Dionysus uh, with some of this spiked wine. Uh, I think that when we get a little more granular about what was really happening in the first, second, third centuries AD, th this hypothesis, I think, gains value that way. And, and, and I try not to be dispositive with my language. We're looking for the, the archaeochemical data to show this once and for all. But you know, the, the book is only proof of concept for what's out there. And the fact that this archaeobotany, archaeochemistry really hasn't received the funding and attention that it deserves. But once it gets that, and I'm working on that, and we can talk about that, once it gets that attention, what's going to happen over the next 10 years? What chalice are we going to find next? What vessel? What proto-mass is going to be unearthed? I mean, I think that we're living at a time when the roots of this faith are really going to emerge for the first time. And, I, and I, again, I do appreciate your, your commitment to scholarship, right, and, and the evidence. And I, I do think that's really important. In, the, in modern ayahuasca circles, for example, there is this sentiment that the plants taught humans how to mix them, to take the dimethyltryptamine and mix it with the Mao inhibitor and all that. And from my perspective, we didn't have whole foods a few thousand years ago. Humans likely, tr I mean, they tried everything. Lizards, <laughs> for example, would you write about? Um, I mean, everything. And I feel like that our ancestors would have kept the things that do what psychedelics do. And, and possibly, because there's also long been speculation that psychedelics underpin religious ritual in general, because of what it does to your body and your relationship to the environment as well. And so I, I do think that anecdote does play some role in this, and I think it's important to point out, but, um, but more specifically to your work, what, um, sorry, there's just so many questions. <laughs> Let's go, yeah, because, because again, this is, these are things that have been in my head for a long time. What, why, why do you think that from what I've studied and you've studied Sanskrit, people are more open to the idea that Soma is made of some sort of psychedelic and the, mm. and the Eastern religions, whereas mm. anytime I've seen this conversation come up over the last 20 years around Christianity and the Western circles, there's much more resistance. Mm. Why do you think that, that is? It's a great question. I, I mean, I do mention it very briefly in the book, I think. Um, I think it's just a, a general bias um, and maybe not even a hard bias, but just a, a, I call it a blind spot as well in academia and particularly among classicists as well. I'm, uh, the, I guess the short answer is that we, we've lost our sacred pharmacopoeia. When, when we think about uh, plant medicine, right? That, that phrase that, that's thrown about a lot today. Um, you mentioned the Amazon. I think about the Amazon too. I think about ayahuasca tourism. Uh, I think that you'll find a lot of books talking about Soma uh, and other Eastern mysticism. You'll find a lot of books on Eastern mysticism in general. Uh, it's hard not to walk around and find a yoga studio near where you're living. Uh, I think these are all products of a, of a different generation, our parents' generation. Uh, and what really struck me about the heart of Western civilization is that there was once a sacred pharmacopoeia. It's undeniable from the literature. 
Um, back to your very first question, part of the reason we don't know this is that we don't study Dioscorides. The, the second you pick up Dioscorides, the father of drugs, father of pharmacology, who wrote his Materia Medica in the first century AD, the exact same time the Gospels are being written, you're seeing wine spiked with all kinds of really colorful ingredients, plants and herbs and toxins, and it's part of a tradition that you can easily trace back in the literature all the way back to Homer. And from Homer to the fall of the Roman Empire over a thousand years, what you're seeing is wine described as a pharmakon, right? Back to that pharmakon Athanasius, the drug of immortality. It's no mistake that the Eucharist is described as the drug of immortality by the early church fathers because there was this sense of really sophisticated uh, botanical understanding that goes all the way back to Homer and this person Circe, this mythical witch Circe, mixing up the pharmaca lugra for Odysseus and his mates. Uh, and obviously it goes back a lot further than that. And so part of the reason I wrote the book was just to show people that within Western civilization, at its roots, in fact, um, is this very sacred pharmacopoeia. Not that it was or was not the sacrament at Eleusis or the original Eucharist, whatever that means, but that this tradition was certainly there. And, um, you know, it begs the question how prevalent it was, how widespread was it really? But one thing you made me laugh in the book, you know, we talked about language earlier and how important it is. And if you think of something like the Mahabharata, and the shloka, like the language was so specific for a reason and every syllable has meaning. And yet you point out that Greeks never invented a word for alcohol. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I should have mentioned that by the way. Yeah, I'm giving these, these, these silly, I'm gonna give shorter answers from now on. Uh, how about this one? Yeah, there's no word for alcohol in Greek. If you, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm running on. If you just think of the word alcohol, uh, the al uh, alcohol is it's obviously from from the Arabic, and it comes from all these chemical experiments that were happening in, in the eighth, ninth, tenth centuries when uh, this this distillation enters Europe. But before that, the Greeks and the Romans didn't invent a word for alcohol. Uh, again, the the Greek word for it, uh, amongst other things, I mean the 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 common word is oinos, obviously, uh, where we get vine. Uh, and uh, but the 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 common you know. Um, appellation was pharmacon, pharmacy. I mean, that's how they referred to as wine because there was no difference between cuisine and pharmacology. You took your medicine with your wine. Uh, so that's what it was. I also want to ask you about the sort of the second idea in the book that I, I think is important. I mean, hugely important, especially in our time. But uh, you did mention something that you bring up at the end of the book, which is you almost had a chalice or a vessel analyzed. You almost had the Vatican release it, and then that didn't quite work out by the time the book was published. But you just said that, you know, you're still working on it. So has there been any advancement on that since, the, since you ended up, uh, since you submitted the final copy of the book? Absolutely. And it wasn't that long ago. That was over the summer. And you're the first person to ask me that. So I'll tell you the answer. Uh, so... Uh, the ancient world, let me give a shorter answer. The ancient world is full of secrets. Uh, so ever since, uh, well, actually from earlier this year and last year, I profile Andrew Coe in the book. He's the, one of the world's leading archaeochemists currently at MIT, but there's never been a proper center for this. There's never been a home for all those different silos that I mentioned earlier, right? That this real transdisciplinary methodology, which is the only way to crack these secrets, because the science of archaeochemistry is a bit of a misnomer. It's not really just the science. You know, on the one hand, you're taking uh, these ancient artifacts and blasting them with this high-tech instrumentation, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. But once you get the results, you have to feed that into a cultural matrix and figure out what was really there. So you need to know the ancient Greek text. You need to know the ancient texts in Latin and put all this stuff together and compare it with all the ethnobotanical literature and compare it with uh, these paleoecological maps to see what was growing where and when and make this, this, this you know, composite picture of what this was. So all that said, uh, we've been having a series of really um, fruitful discussions uh, at Harvard uh, with various departments about putting all this together, um, uh, getting rid of the silos and attacking this issue in a very serious way at the highest levels of academia and not just Harvard, but, but, but elsewhere. Uh, so th this conversation is really percolating 
amongst uh, a lot of different specialties. And with that, I won't say exactly what, but there's a lot of sites that are now ripe for investigation. Andrew Co is sitting on five to 10,000 organic samples that haven't been properly analyzed. And at the end of my book, I say, it may have been discovered already, whatever that it was there. I mean, it, it may be sitting in a museum somewhere. It may be sitting in Andrew Coe's archives. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a process of slowing down and taking the time and money to, to, uh, to test this stuff. And uh, there's a lot of exciting developments on the way. So you do make a shout out at the very end of the book, uh, asking the Pope to join you on your first psychedelic <laughs> experience, uh, when, if, if and when that does happen, which I hope it does, but that's again my bias. Um, but but I, I really enjoyed at the end how you talk about how the Catholic Church was going through this entire sex scandal, obviously, well, child abuse sex scandal, and yet, you know, they, they, there's so much they try to cover up. Do you Talk a little bit about what you think happened around that time, three to 400 years into the religion that they started to. And specifically, uh, I'd love you to touch upon that, as I mentioned, the second part, which is you write women and drugs for 2000 years that they, they have been the two biggest thorns in the side of the church. Right. Um... Yeah, I'll, I'll do deference to, to Pope Francis. I do, I want to be respectful about this. And, and yesterday was a very hard day for the Catholic Church, for fellow Catholics out there who've read the report on Cardinal McCarrick, who I actually had the opportunity to meet at some point in Washington, DC. Um, you know, the, the church is going through hard times. And another reason I wrote this book is not to attack the church, but to, to, to talk about the church and Catholicism in a way that, uh, that tells a fuller story. And all this is ancient history about the women and drugs, largely is ancient history. Uh, I'm not doing this to, to impugn the Pope or, or the current leadership. I'm just, I'm trying to, to tease out uh, the details of how women do seem to be involved in the consecration of the early Eucharist. Uh, we do know that from the writings of Hippolytus and other church fathers from as early as the second century into the third centuries AD, that Gnostic groups like uh, the followers of Marcus uh, included women consecrating their sacrament and throwing pharmakon into it. I, I mentioned this one passage from Hippolytus in his refutation uh, of all the heresies, where he talks about women throwing drugs in, and he uses the word pharmakon seven times in a row to describe their Eucharist. Uh, and I descend into the catacombs under Rome and look at all these frescoes, and what you see are women consecrating wine. Uh, now, whether it was a Eucharist or whether it was the wine of the refrigerium, which was the pagan Roman ritual of uniting the living and the dead, uh, we're not quite sure. But those 300 years were this intercultural encounter uh, where you see not just uh, paganism and Christianity bumping up against each other, but, but power politics of women and men. And, and you know, in many ways, it, it shouldn't be a surprise and it's not new but the, the church really just stepped in to the role of the, of the Roman Empire, which was a largely patriarchal uh, uh, male-led proposition. It's, it's, it should be no surprise how the priesthood came to be, uh, but it's not the only version of Christianity that was around. There were women uh, deeply involved. Um, and I'll just finish with this. Let's not forget that Mary Magdalene in the Gospel of John is the first and only witness to the resurrection of Jesus. It's she who sees him, has a visionary experience of Jesus, and is tasked by Jesus uh, of telling the, the male apostles about the resurrection. So for a time, Mary Magdalene, without getting too damn brown about it, she was the church. The church was a woman. And John is explicit about that in chapter 20. And don't feel the need to truncate your answers. I like listening. <laughs> so, so you keep saying that, but don't worry about that. I find it funny that um, you can see over my shoulder, Osiris is sitting there. He usually curls up during my interviews and yet he's very active during yours. So, <laughs> and he's also almost 21. So he's going for immortality as well, I think. Uh, <laughs> now in the process of writing the book, how did your own relationship to Catholicism change? Thank you for asking that. And I'm going to send this to my friends in the Vatican. It got deeper. I am to be totally honest with you. 
it, it, it got deeper. Um, and, you know, I still go back and forth about this. I title uh, the introduction to my book, A New Reformation. And I'm still going back and forth about what I mean by that. I don't know what I mean about, by, by that, but I, I do know that, that each attempt to reanalyze the faith has always been an attempt to get back to the roots, right? So beginning with Martin Luther and the humanism movement, I talk a lot about in the book, this, this concept of ad fontes, uh, back to the source, back to the fountain, back to the, the real source of wisdom. Uh, it begins with the Protestants. You, you see it all the way through uh, the evangelical community and the sola scriptura and just looking to the, to the word of God. And I think there's always an attempt just to figure out what was happening. What was the message of this Jesus? And the, the, the only honest answer is that there was no monolithic Christianity. Just like today, you look around and you see 33,000 denominations of Christianity, um, a few of which include psychedelics as their sacrament, and I'm thinking of the Santo Daime and others, or even the Native American church, which has some Christian syncr uh, syncretism to it. Uh, I think that the, the possibility of a psychedelic sacrament in antiquity is not laughable. In fact, it's, it's, it's quite plausible, according to some of the literature and some of the data that's just beginning to emerge on the scientific front. And so for me, when I look and I see this kind of very Hellenic, you know, Christianity that was very much at the roots of the Catholic Church, which landed in Rome, not by mistake, but because Rome was there in Magna Graecia, this very Greek riddled environment that called to Greek mystics mystics dedicated to Demeter, Persephone, and Dionysus uh, for centuries, including Pythagoras and Parmenides and Empedocles. Uh, I mean, this is the religious tradition uh, based on Peter Kingsley's writing uh, that really, really speaks to me. And the more I found that Greek influence uh, underneath the Vatican, in, in some cases, literally uh, in the catacombs, the more I began to really love and appreciate what the what, what this was all about. Uh, and like the more I read the Greek and the more evidence that, that I see, uh, I mean, I talked to Andrew Sullivan about this, um, the, the, the more in love with Christianity I become. Now it might not be your version of Christianity or, or some people's definition of Christianity today, but again, if you just step back and take a very honest look at the Greek of the New Testament and the Greek landscape, in which it emerged, uh, I think it's a really powerful statement because to me, my Christianity combines the best of the ancient Greek mysteries and the best of the morality and the ethics and the love and the agape that comes with, with Christianity. And that to me does seem like, like an innovation in the first and second centuries. And I think it's a very powerful call that Jesus was making to, to, to love your neighbor. Hmm. You didn't mention the Church of Coltrane, <laughs> which I think is up there, <laughs> which I actually do love uh, that idea. Uh, <laughs> well, cannabis is a sacrament in their church, so and the music, True. so that's that's True. very much more my speed. Um, the the mysticism I have always thought of the Gnostics along the lines of the Sufis. I mean, in every religion, you have sort of the, the structure that comes to say, this is what we are. And then you have the mystics who actually want to experience what the, the charismatic leaders experience. They don't just want to regurgitate the rituals. They want to live them. And I think that's really important. And I, and I, I, I wonder how willing, especially at this point, I mean, this is sort of a sidetrack, but one of the things that on the podcast and in my work that I've been studying this year is the, what does a digital religion look like and does QAnon fit that? And, you know, we don't know because this is brand new territory, but like, how does, how does a charismatic leader who's a cult leader operate in virtual reality, right? Is their presence through the lens in the same sense that they have this, this power? Uh, and I think these are all questions we have to reckon with because they're starting to emerge right now and influence politics on a pretty big level. But getting getting back to um, the mystical aspect of it, why why do you think that certain leaders are so are so hesitant about the ability for their following to actually experience what Jesus experienced, not just sort of hope to at the end of their life 
get to this place where they're accepted for what they did, but actually experience, you know, the ritual itself. Hmm. Well, this is okay. Now we're cooking with grease. Uh, I mean, that's, that, that's the question. And, and again, this, this, I didn't write this book to be anti-organized religion. In some cases, it's the exact opposite, which we can talk about. Um, but, you know, in the, in the intro, I mentioned Brother David Steindl Rosh, this, this Benedictine monk, who's a hero of mine. And he talks about that, that age old tension between uh, the mystics and, and the dogma and doctrine of organized faith. Um, I don't think you can have one without the other, quite frankly. And the balance, as Brother David says, is just to rediscover that orig original visionary power and live in it, live in it as a lived experience. This is what Joseph Campbell says of religion, about a lived experience. Maybe why the charisma of QAnon and other leaders resonates with people, because it's a lived experience. We're talking about emotional uh, potential. Um, that, that's how the, the great anthropologist Clifford Geertz defines religion, these powerful, pervasive, and long-lasting moods and motivations he talks about. Uh, that only happens when you're talking about something that, that gets inside people's bones. Uh, and that, that's what the mystical experience is. It's how these religions are born. Brother David says it's in, virtually impossible to start a religion without mystical experience, like Moses in the burning bush and Paul on the road to Damascus or Peter in Acts is, is, is caught up in a trance. Uh, you know, this is, this is always there in our past. And the idea is that it was only mystics and saints, um, largely, who were authorized to experience that. And the, the, the Catholic Church has always had um, a quirky relationship with the saints and mystics and visionaries. Uh, because what good, what good is the hierarchy of the church if there's a, this direct pipeline, this Gnostic pipeline? to God. And I would argue that there's every reason for the church. Um, and, and I play with this question throughout the book and I use different language in different ways. Uh, but I think that the church is there as a sacred container for this experience. And like in my own case, I can speak to just, just for me. I haven't done psychedelics, but I can envision a time uh, when it's legal in five to 10 years time, maybe earlier, uh, where I could go to a retreat center and experience psilocybin, not just under the care and guidance of trained medical personnel, uh, but under the care of a priest or, or a pastor or a chaplain, a psychedelic chaplain who would uh, go with me on this journey, which is nothing less than a journey. I mean, two years preparing for it emotionally and psychologically in my case is what I would want. Um, I mean, intense preparation in the days that precede it. Uh, by my side while it's happening, talking about it afterwards. Uh, I mean, that, that, that's what I envision. I think that would speak to lots of people. Uh, it's impossible to, to predict, but I do think that there's a way for the, the structure of organized faith to invite in these mystical experiences and, in fact, and give them meaning, and give them structure. Well, exactly. And that's one of the biggest points I made in, in my book. And again, getting back to ritual, ritual was therapy. Like when you're in smaller tribal structures, you, you know, the mental health and health in general is, a, is communal. It's never just about the individual. One topic I write about often is the difference between the perceptions of individual cultures like America and then Asian cultures, which are much more collectivist mm -hmm. and how they perceive, like there's no, there's no anti-mask rallies in Asian countries, <laughs> like because they because they understand that the health their health is dependent upon everyone else around them, and I think that's something that's lost in our culture. And there are many things about our culture that I love, but that is definitely lost this un this understanding of the strength. And I and I think that does speak to religion at its best. Uh, you mentioned the moral dictates, and I've always found that that's what religion brings to people much more than the metaphysics. The metaphysics to me are, you know, when you see people speaking in tongues, you know, what is, what is that really? But if you're loving your neighbor and you're going out and partaking in charity, that's really powerful. Yeah. And, and that's, that's my Christianity. That, that's what I say with a straight face at, at the end of the book. I do consider myself a Christian. Maybe Pope Francis disagrees. That maybe, maybe evangelicals might disagree. I hope not. I really, I really do hope not because um, I'm, I'm struggling with my own identity crisis here, uh, which is, I talk about in, in the afterward, where the, the only reason I came across Latin and Greek 
and this investigation into the roots of the faith was through the Jesuits. And the Jesuits always asked me, uh, propelled me to question, uh, to, to question everything. What good is faith if it's, if it's untested? Uh, but the, the, you know, these were the folks who also taught me to be a man for others. Uh, and I, I've carried that into my legal practice uh, to make sure I dedicate my, my pro bono efforts to where they need to go. Um, I, I try and carry that to my family and my friends. And I try and be a, a, good, uh, a good citizen. And uh, I think it, it, was, it was that training that, that I had. Um, and all those pro-social behaviors uh, which I found in the psychedelic literature, by the way. Something else that, that, that really intrigued me is how the volunteers talk about, uh, and some psychologists refer to it as the science of awe, where, whereby after one of these experiences, all these pro-social behaviors are unleashed, like kindness and self-sacrifice and resource sharing. And, you know, it seems, it seems crazy and hippie, but uh, maybe under the right settings and with the right mindset, uh, a very powerful experience like that uh, can can guide us all towards what a more humane society. It seems like the kind of things that we could use right now. Yeah, absolutely, and especially I mean, you reference hippies. You know, I always point out that in the 1960s, one out of every three adults in America were on some form of tranquilizer. So, the, like uh, Milltown was the first blockbuster drug, and I actually grew up in Milltown, which is the town that it was named for. <laughs> so I have a long history with like thinking about these things. Um, but the uh, the um, you mentioned a little uh, a moment ago, and I want to kind of close with a little bit of more speculation. You've kind of made some of these points, but I. I think it's important. Uh, Joseph Campbell said that he thinks that there should effectively be a reformation every 20 years, because in order for a religion to suit the times that they live in, they're, they're, you know, it has to update because we're always evolving creatures. And so recently when the Pope came out and said that he'll accept homosexual or he wants to accept homosexuals as a civil union, in my head, I, I was like, you can't just say marriage. Like, is it really that revolutionary at this point? Um, but what in your eyes, what, say it does, say, say you do get these, these um, chalices analyzed and it does, the evidence is irrefutable that there were some substances in there that we haven't really thought about before, the church in general hasn't thought about. What does that reformation look like? What does a ritual look like 10 years from now if that knowledge is accepted and how could it strengthen the religion? Okay, so it's a little above my pay grade, but I'll be happy to, I'll be happy to speculate uh, and, and keep it short. I think um, with, the, with the Lurley proviso that it's illegal right now and the additional proviso that it's somewhat impossible to predict, uh, I can see this going in lots of different directions. Um, what's going to happen in Oregon, what is happening as we speak in real time, is the very beginning of a regulated system, uh, a therapeutic system. And, you know, in short order, uh, the mental health care industry uh, is going to change uh, pre pretty quickly. So folks will be able to avail themselves of psilocybin only as one example in the coming years for things like anxiety, depression, PTSD, maybe end of life distress, uh, which for me raises religious and spiritual questions, uh, particularly end of life distress. You know, in the Catholic Church, there's not just a Eucharist, uh, there is the viaticum, there's the, 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 the last rites, uh, um, which help usher you into the afterlife. Uh, it's a concept you find in lots of different faiths, by the way. Uh, so I can envision. Uh, if I were approaching my, my, last, my last days, uh, I can envision receiving psilocybin, uh, not just from, again, a medical professional in one of these licensed FDA approved retreat centers, but uh, if you're a person of faith and you've been going to church uh, every Sunday for 50, 60 years, uh, wouldn't you want your, your pastor there with you? Um, maybe uh, maybe that, that's an opportunity uh, for some of this biotechnology to find its way to the faithful. And that could really change faith uh, for, for folks facing the end of life, which is why the scientists, I think, need to, need to keep doing this research to figure out what kind of effect that does have on people approaching death. Uh, it could be a real boon, a real, a real gift to people. 
Um, something else that might happen is uh, you find people gathering in community, like you have today in Brazil, in the Santo Daime. Um, you know, it's, it, it occupies this space in Brazil and a few other countries, uh, but it's, it's not unthinkable to imagine a psychedelic sacrament in small community many years from now. Um, again, in a way that that's, that's legal and, and protected, uh, if more and more evidence is, is forthcoming on the scientific side. Uh, so th there's all kinds of ways that this could go. I really do think it's this decade though. I think it's within this decade. I think by 2030, um, all these questions are gonna start um, arising and, and really influencing the direction of not just Christianity, uh, but, but Judaism and potentially other faiths. From my experiences, Judaism has been much more open to mysticism. <laughs> Maybe not orthodox, but just my general group of friends and, and and the culture which is which is i think important but they've always been i mean that's why the link between judaism and buddhism has been so strong and judaism and kundalini yoga uh has been so strong for a long time uh do you have any concerns I, and i'll preface this with one that i have because again writing about psychedelics for a long time i was very happy when ketamine which is not a psychedelic chemically but it's kind of gets lumped in there um, you know, but it, it, it was fast tracked by the FDA and it showed efficacy. And I was very happy about that, but the trials that passed were not solid. Six people died and, uh, three committed suicide and the FDA allowed the explanation that that was because they came off the drug, not that it was a side effect of coming off mm. of the drug. And so I'm just saying that we're entering a space where you have substances that are thousands of years old you've referenced it's probably been going on much longer than we have records for i agree with that and now you have pharmaceutical companies coming in and trying to create patents off of different molecules you know how um just changing molecules in order to do that do you see any dangers of that as it enters the healthcare system because what you just presented was beautiful and I, it is it is the future i hope for having suffered from anxiety disorder and been on a benzo and understanding what that is, I think that this is a good way to go, but what are, do you, do you foresee any dangers? Mm, uh, what I foresee is a very complicated landscape, uh, I guess is the best way to put it because the, these therapeutics uh, and, and there are different interests investigating them. Uh, some from the, the purely clinical research, some from the for-profit pharma biotech vantage, uh, but they're all converging on these substances at the same time uh, for, for different reasons. Uh, and, and I do think they're powerful. Uh, I do think they're dangerous. Psychedelics are absolutely not for everybody, uh, which is why I myself haven't yet taken them. Uh, and, and I do think they're sacred at the same time. Um, at least when, when, when used with the, with the right intention um, and in the right circumstances. And so how, how do all these conflicting interests bounce off each other? Uh, I, don't, I don't really know. I don't think anyone, anyone knows yet, but I think you, you can already glimpse what's happening in cannabis and the commercialization of cannabis, um, which wasn't the case even 10 years ago, which is why I keep saying 10 years from now, what is this landscape look like, it's going to be everything. It's going to be a potluck of, of pharmaceutical interventions and hopefully um, insurance-backed retreat centers, um, off-the-grid churches, um, it, the, you know, uh, folks receiving the viaticum at the end of life. It's, it, it's going to be a hodgepodge of different things. I think that what it's important to keep in mind, um, even from the therapeutic angle, is that the mystical experience seems to be key to what's happening. Mm. Uh, and when you talk to the researchers like Tony Bossis at NYU or Bill Richards at Hopkins, um, this is what they talk about. And they are quick to remind me that despite the therapeutic outcomes, um, it's the depth of the mystical experience that seems to be determinative. Uh, and you know, even when atheists are describing themselves as being bathed in God's love, it, that all to stop you in your tracks if you're a pharmaceutical CEO and question how best to structure these, these, these sessions. 
uh, because it's not a magic pill. It's, 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 it, you know, it has very much to do with, with how it's, it's consumed and why it's consumed and the preparation that goes into that. Uh, I think that that's, that's almost stupidly clear from the past half century of research into these substances, let alone the thousands of years and this book of mystery traditions that I write about to show that there was this really sacred container to this stuff. So it would be my hope that, that even in a very secular setting, that, 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 that some of this uh, sacredness uh, were somehow maintained. Well, you do write about ath your atheist friends. I am an atheist. Uh, I just find all religions fascinating. And so I, rather than deciding on one, I've just decided to take the best of all of them and understand that. But I do concur with their, um, with their assessment that there is something transcendent about the experience itself. I do hope you get to experience that. Um, last thing, and it is short, you, now that you have a New York Times bestseller, congratulations, and you are getting a lot of press, and I'm sure this is going to be a long tail book as things progress. Has your wife signed off on the second uh, book? <laughs> we were just, she's here, actually. We were just talking, to, we were just talking about that a couple of days ago. Uh, what, what shall I say? I think she's happy for me to proceed, and I owe her an enormous, enormous debt of gratitude uh, for, for being by my side the entire way and keeping me honest, which is what I meant to tell Joe Rogan, by the way. Uh, she's, she's very sharp, much sharper than me. She went to Harvard Law School. And every time I came to her with a new piece of data, she would say, really? I mean, can't you do better? I mean, you know, <laughs> make, an, make an argument here. So she kept me honest. Um, she provided a wonderful home for our daughters and took care of them when I was off in the catacombs. So this is, uh, this is why I dedicated the book to her.